and I believe we are live. We are live and press continue. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our town hall where we're going to be talking about all things reopening in the higher ed space. Um, and as with everything in our office, we are all about making sure that the voices of those who are most impacted and are doing the work are um, front and center. My name is Julia Mejia. I'm an at-large city councilor for the city of Boston. And today, my co-host is Dr. Gail crump um, And uh, Dr. Gail, um, please introduce yourself. Sure. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Dr. Gail crump -Swaby. You will have I, to go off mute. I am off mute. Can you not, not hear me? Oh, now we can, yes. Okay, all right, great. Again, I'm Dr. Gail crump Swaby, and I am an associate professor at um, Springfield College at the Boston campus. However, today I'm not necessarily representing Springfield College. Um, I'm also a clinician in a group practice um, in Boston as well, a mental health um, therapist as well, and I work along with um, Councillor Mejia on several different um, initiatives in the city. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, we today will be breaking out into uh, breakout sessions and uh, exploring a number of different topics and um, questions. But before we do, I think it's really important for us to ground ourselves in the voices of those who are living the realities and doing the work in this space. And I would like um, for us to be grounded in, in that and hearing from uh, from some of the folks before we break out. Um, I'd love to invite uh, Vanessa um, Snow to first uh, go ahead and introduce herself and, and just ground us in the voices that we need to keep in our hearts and minds as we guide this conversation. Um, good afternoon and thank you, Councillor Mejia. Uh, my name is Vanessa Snow. I'm a resident of Hyde Park. Um, and I am a community organizer who has been part of the Northeastern for the Common Good Coalition, um, which we've uh, existed for a couple of years now and have been a coalition of students, workers, community members um, from Roxbury and have been organizing um, around how to make Northeastern University a more, uh, a more equitable um, and um, just institution. Um, for its workers, for its students, and how it also engages with the adjacent community. Um, and we've all been um, uh, in touch this entire shutdown um, after Northeastern abruptly closed. Um, and so we've been following it carefully and several, um, you know, from the, from the unions, uh, from the student organizations um, have, been, have been meeting about this um, and have really developed some really um, important demands. Uh, you know, they feel like they've had no voice uh, in, in the reopening of the campus, um, both from, you know, from our local government and also from especially campus administration. Um, and so I actually know there is a student um, on this call from Northeastern who he can speak more to the student organizing that's been going on. Um, and his name is um, Noble Wushtak. I don't know if Thank Noble wants to introduce himself. Um, hello, uh, I'm Noble Wushtak. Um, I'm advising, oh, sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay, great. Uh, I'm a rising second year undergraduate at Northeastern University, and I'm part of a coalition of student organizations called the NU uh, Coalition for Affordability, Responsibility, and Equity, or NU Care. Uh, basically, in May, we presented, we created a petition with seven demands, including uh, reducing tuition for online and hybrid classes, uh, making sure all students, faculty, and staff, including subcontracted workers like cleaning and dining staff, have adequate PPE and uh, making sure Northeastern is um, transparent about how our police department will enforce social distancing. And so far, we've, um, we are a coalition of, I think, over 14 different student organizations, and we've gotten very little response from the university. Um, we were able to have a meeting with some lower level admins, such as like the Dean of Spiritual and Cultural Life, but 
the admins we met with basically had no power to change anything. And they kind of just splashed off our demands saying tuition reduction is unrealistic since it's the same curriculum, even though we don't have access to the same resources, saying that they would talk about um, providing PPE and hazard pay to dining staff, but there's no guarantee. So right now we are just trying to really focus on pushing for tuition reduction for online classes and as well as making sure that subcontracted workers in hazardous working environments like dining staff have adequate PPE and um, hazard pay because we think that's really important and we definitely want to work with um, the unions at you know Northeastern and any for the common good with that. So yeah, that's just our perspective right now. And I can also share the demands that we made in the chat. And yeah, uh, I'll be happy to talk more if there are any other questions about um, any care. Thank you. Thank you, Noble. Thank you for that, Noble. I'm having a little bit of technical difficulty. I'm not sure if anyone could hear me. Yes, we, we can, can hear you. Okay. Yes. Um, okay, great. I'm gonna turn my video off just because I have a bad connection. Um, uh, but I also, before we move on, I am, I, I um, wanted to ensure that I give my council colleagues an opportunity to um, introduce themselves. Uh, I know that Councilor Bach has been on the forefront as it relates to this particular issue, and I'd love to um, open up the floor for Councilor Bach. Thank you so much, Councilor Mejia, um, and thanks to everybody for being on this call. I think as Folks may know I represent the area that runs from Mission Hill through Fenway, Back Bay, Beacon Hill on the West End, um, which includes a whole bunch of universities, including um, Boston University and parts of Northeastern, our two largest universities in terms of student population. Um, and I have this week called for those universities to rethink their plans and really switch to an all virtual model for the fall. Um, I think, you know, we, Councilor Mejia and Councilor Braden and Council President Janie and I co-hosted a hearing back in early July, um, asking the universities to share their plans. And I, and certainly I've been following up with them ever since then and beforehand. And well, you know, I think we've all seen a lot of elaborate plan making on certain fronts um, and, and also a lot of resources put into, for instance, testing capacity. I think there's just some big picture public health questions that remain unanswered. Um, there are issues for students, issues for workers um, and, also issues for the neighbors who share our on-campus and off-campus um, neighborhoods with these universities. And I, I think the reality is that our, um, our, our city community and the university communities are completely intertwined, right? They're one and the same. And I think it, I, I teach myself undergraduates and, um, and I know how much we're all yearning to have a normal experience this fall, um, but the reality is that we can't because of the public health crisis and there's no way back into economic viability and into the kind of academic communities that we know and love in person without going through um, public health and really being conservative and protecting everybody's everybody's you know wellness and life um, and and I think that uh, we have I've you know said a lot over the last few days just about the fact that we're in a very particular moment right now where we've got some worrying upticks in the indicators in Massachusetts. And at the same time, we really have COVID out of control in a lot of hot spots around the country. And so I think we need our big institutions to recognize the role that they play in this huge population swing we see every um, fall and uh, ask our, our administrators um, to, to really, in light of that situation, rethink things. Um, and I wanna just recognize that there are a lot of folks on this call who have been who have been raising these questions and calling this out for months now, um, and so this isn't this isn't new. We didn't wake up, you know, this week and say, "Hey, this is a problem." The reason that I have been very publicly vocal this week is because it feels like we're about to sort of pass a point of no return. Um, and and you know, no matter what happens, we have to really continue to push. You know, if we're if we are back with hybrid models. You're gonna see me and Councilor Mejia and lots of other people really focusing on what are the protections for workers? What are the protections for students? What are we doing to protect our off-campus neighbors, right? There's a million kind of harm reduction and mitigation things we need to see. I think we need much stronger off-campus policies, but I think that there's a, a stage earlier of harm reduction for everybody right now. And that's really keeping things virtual that can be virtual. And we know they can be because the schools have made plans for people to learn that way um, and for people to teach that way. So, um, so, that's where I am on all this and really uh, glad to be part of this conversation today. Thank you for convening it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Bach. I will just say, you know, my mom is a food handler and has been for the past 21 years at a, at a college. And so the idea of her going back to work 
at 71 years old because she's too poor to retire is really scary to me. Um, and I think that this conversation has to be grounded in the uh, wellness and, and public safety and, and health of all. Um, and so really happy to be convening everyone here. I do believe that I was also, we were also joined by my counselor uh, colleague at large, uh, counselor Sabi George. Yes. Thank you, Julia. Uh, thank you for convening everyone and bringing um, such a large group together. I think there's uh, quite a bit of diversity of experience and thought here in the room. So look forward to the discussion uh, this afternoon. Happy to be here and thank you for the invitation. Thank you, thank you. And I'm gonna go on to, I'm going to ask um, Ms. Lacey. I know you were instrumental in bringing us here together. Um, we co-hosted this event with you. Um, you brought it to our attention and has, have been incredibly vocal. And so would love to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself and help us uh, round ourselves in the voice that you bring to the table. Thank you all so much. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Really appreciate you, Councillor Mejia and all the counselors present, um, as well as your staff for helping us to convene this conversation. Um, I have a brief statement um, to ground us in this issue. Many groups of people make up colleges and universities, but if you look at BU's fall 2020 plans, you would think that the university consists solely of undergraduate students. BU's hybrid plan, Learn From Anywhere, gives all undergrads the choice to learn in person or remotely, to return to campus or stay home. The university's workers receive no such choice. We know that many people work at universities, not just professors, including graduate student workers like myself, staff, adjunct instructors, property services workers. For all of us and for Boston neighborhoods, college reopening is a question not just of education, but of ethics, labor, public health, economics, and individual mental and physical well being. Universities, including but not limited to BU, have bent over backward to accommodate undergrads, their primary source of income, but have time and again disrespected and disregarded the backbone of their institutions, their workers' lives and livelihoods. We are here today with the help of Counselor Mejia and her staff to affirm that higher education workers' voices must be heard and heeded during a pandemic and always. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you for that. I am going to ask uh, Jamie Wilson from SEIU 509. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, uh, Kristen and Councillor Mejia for, and all those who helped bring this together. And it is great to see so many people uh, joining us on this, um, on this uh, very important meeting. So I am the president of the higher education chapter for SEIU 509, of which BU is a part of. Um, uh, we service adjunct faculty and full-time non-tenure faculty at BU and other, uh, at Northeastern and other universities in the Boston Metropolitan um, area. We have been working on this very issue about fall reopening plans for not just BU, but for all six of our universities since the pandemic began and schools had to go into remote triage in March. Um, it has been very disconcerting to us that BU has not been communicating with faculty on how teaching should be conducted in the fall, what needs faculty have uh, in addition to those of the students. We also have been, um, have been discouraged by the, the constant forcing of faculty, students, staff, all workers at BU to be on campus um, regardless of their age um, and only receiving an accommodation to be off campus if they are considered a high risk uh, according to the CDC guidelines. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And also that in, in these plans that BU have put to, has put together, there is no real um, there is no real plan to ensure the safety of those forced to be on campus if someone tests positive for COVID nineteen. Um, so there, uh, the plans are insufficient to say the least. 
And we just want um, everyone to know that our union has been working tirelessly with many of you um, to, to ensure the safety, the health and safety of all workers, not just the members of 509, but all workers on BU's campus. So again, thank you very much for convening this town hall. This is an important step, a uh, further step towards hopefully convincing BU to do the right thing. Thank you, Jamie. Um, just a quick, um, Councillor Mejia um, is having a little bit of technical difficulty. So as her co-host, I am continuing on with the conversation. Um, so I know um, Kara was the other person that was um, interested in speaking. So Kara, I'm gonna have you um, um, speak at this moment. Hi, um, I'm a, also um, a worker, a staff member at Boston University. Um, hoping to accrete to the um, to the existing SEIU union. Um, I've been, um, as Jamie so eloquently said, we've been working on this since, um, really since the pandemic started. So March, April, May, all of these months. Um, you know, I was just going back and forth with someone in the chat about um, uh, how scared we all are to go back and the requirement that faculty be on campus and thus and therefore staff being required to be on campus as well. Um, I know at, at Mugar Library, they, they're, they, they're being forced to be back on campus um, and have to file a workplace adjustment otherwise if they, if they wanna uh, pursue um, working remotely still. Um, despite the president's um, statement that people that can work remotely should re work remotely. Um, and I have been actually going in since March, at least once or twice a, uh, a week, um, at least twice a month throughout and during the pandemic, even in March and April when the school was shut down and the, the city was, was closed and during parking tickets, um, in order to get work done and scanning done for students um, because our library remained um, operable and provided those services to our students. Um, I found that to be uh, <laughs> dangerous, scary, and, um, and, and not, really, uh, not really a great move. Um, so I'm very concerned about going back. I do have a, a little bit more control than some folks in um, our other offices do about my schedule and around my schedule, but I certainly don't have the PPE I need to work circulation when I will be working circulation. I don't have any evidence that there has been um, plastic um, plexiglass barriers set up. I don't have, you know, I'm not being provided with masks, uh, face shields. I purchased all of that for myself because, mm -hmm. and I typically don't uh, work circulation, but I will be forced to do uh, not be able to have as many student workers um, in the library. Uh, we've, we've, you know, I really honestly think this is not going to last very long, and we're putting lives at risk because because of this. We're we're actually like we're lambs going into slaughter. Okay, if some of us are not going to make it um, straight up, if we make it to October fifteenth, I'll be shocked. Shocked. And sadly, some of us are not gonna make it. And I don't wanna be one of those people. So that's it for me. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Yes, um, thank you so much for that. Sorry for the technical difficulty. I think that, you know, the more that I hear, I feel like this is a conversation uh, that not only needs to happen, but that those who are listening in um, really take the lead from those who are living the realities right now. Um, this is not a time to play politics when it comes to people's lives. Um, so I believe um, we have one more person, Michelle. Um, Michelle Beasley. Yes. Beasley, hi. I'm a lecturer at Met College in Boston University and also a happy member of local SEIU 509. Um, and I've been nor enormously appreciative of all the work the union has been doing, even though it feels very futile at this moment. I, I wanted to speak to um, one of the things that I've really observed going on here, which I think is that behind a lot of the university's 
uh, stonewalling is, um, I think somebody alluded to, well, they really need the undergrads back because that's their cash cow. Actually, Met College and in my program in particular are probably 99% profit. There are very few full-time faculty. There are very few resources in that college. Um, some huge percent, some 70, 80% of faculty are actually adjunct lecturers who are low paid, um, as we all know, uh, those of us who, who teach there. Um, and one of the things that's been happening is they've been touting their new testing facilities, which was in the newsletter this morning, um, how great it's gonna be. They have not said whether they would tell anyone if, any, if they found out that somebody had COVID on campus and where they were. They have not said they would do contact tracing or shut things down if it, more than X percent of people started showing up in their, their little testing facilities with COVID. But I, will, I do wanna speak also to the fact that this, there's a huge economic burden, aside from the, re, the reality of having to purchase your own PPE if you're forced to go to campus um, or pay your own health costs if you get sick. The other part of this is, is that BU is forcing all faculty, including adjuncts, um, who are only paid for under our contract for classroom time, they're forcing us all to completely devise brand new courses that will be held online, which they have demanded be recorded, and which they've demanded all of our course materials, which means that they are basically about to steal free intellectual property. In the past, when you developed an online course that would pay you $10,000 and give you six months to do so. We've been asked basically by August 21st to have completed an entire revamping that can be of a course that can be delivered either in person or off uh, asymptomatic um, asynchronously and synchronously. And, and in addition to that, they're requiring lecturers and all faculty to hold a minimum of two office hours a week. Some, and they offered it, oh, and you can do it in person. So I think what's happening here is a lot of this is a money grab um, and an IP grab by the administration to enrich themselves while giving these, oh, vague, like we can't afford, we have such a big quote unquote budget, projected budget for shortfall, which they haven't bothered to explain adequately in public. Um, so there's a lot of lack of transparency there. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about the exploitation and exploitation aspect of this, not just of the students who are gonna be ex or being exploited and basically sent as lambs to slaughter as someone said, but, but also the exploitation of the staff who are forced to go in and the faculty are forced to create brand new content and give it away for free. And I, I, I find it morally um, reprehensible on all fronts. And I'm, I'm deeply concerned and there's been just zero interest in hearing any of that at any town hall meeting called at the college level or the university level or in any other forum. Um, so, and you know, the directors of the programs are basically helpless. They, they are sympathetic, but they can't do anything either. They're in exactly the same boat unless they themselves are also high risk, they have to go in as well. Um, so it's not even as if our direct managers are, you know, part of this problem, actually, you know, the, what you would think of as frontline management in a union situation, they're not the problem. It's the, it's the owners, basically. Marissa, and I'm sorry to, I just. And thank you very much. We're, we're done. Marissa said it all, Michelle said it all, we're done. Um, no, just joking. I, I just want to be super mindful of the time. I know that I added these uh, brief introductions just because I think it's important for us to be grounded in, in the conversation. And one conversation that was not um, brought into the space, and this will be the last, and I'm going to challenge this uh, person to be really brief. Um, it is the mental health component of this transition back into campus that no one seems to be talking about the social, emotional, and traumatic impact that um, COVID has had on our students and our, and our staff. And I think it's really important for us if we're gonna have this conversation to ask Dr. Gail um, Crumpswaby to really help us understand in 30 seconds the social, emotional, traumatic impact that, this, uh, that we need to think about as we move forward. 30 seconds. All right, let's see if I can do this in 30 seconds. Um, 
Yes, absolutely. I think we need to look at the return, not just for if, if folks are returning, we're not just looking at students or staff, we're looking at faculty and everyone holistically, that it can be a very traumatic experience after being in, after not being in that space for a very long time and then having to go back in without the necessary precautions that are needed. People have already at this point either have um, faced um, issues of depression, issues of anxiety, and that may just exacerbate a lot of those symptoms and, and, and those feelings of returning to a place where they feel there's no um, sense of safety or precautionary measures that are put in place. And then you have to think about in terms of you know, do many of these um, faculty or adjunct faculty has to have the capacity to understand from that perspective and um, looking at, you know, how do you teach from a trauma informed kind of perspective, because that's another piece that needs to be added into it too as well. So you're talking about not just the, the, the physical health, but you also have to look at the mental health of folks. And those two things tend to go hand in hand. You can't separate one and say, then we can't talk about the other, because if you're not taking care of the person's mental health as well, or being uh, mindful of that, then the physical manifestations are going to show up. And if the physical manifestation, the physical health is not being taken care of or looked at, the mental health uh, manifestation is going to show. So we need to look at it from a holistic perspective. Yes. Yeah, so you see why that was so important for us to bring into the space before we broke out into our little sessions. Um, so I think uh, I'm getting the cue from Brady uh, Baca, who is our civic engagement coordinator, um, that we are ready to break into our uh, breakout sessions uh, where you will have a facilitator uh, that's going to help guide the dialogue. There'll be some folks who stay in this room here and our conversation will be live. I'd love um, Dr. Gale to be a part of the live um, to stay here in this room with me, Brady, if that's possible. Um, but yeah, let's break into our breakout session. And let's come back ready to um, not just share, this is going to be a solution-oriented dialogue, because there's no sense of having a conversation about the conversation and no solutions, right? So let's really come back with some really concrete uh, recommendations in terms of how we should move forward. Um, so Brady, go ahead and break us up as you see fit. Yes, thank you, counselor. So uh, I'll be, so I will be uh, just making a couple quick edits to the breakout rooms, just because there were some changes in the numbers. Um, and yes, yeah, so so in terms of the facilitator, uh, for each breakout room, we'll have the opportunity to decide who that will be amongst themselves. We just ask that someone who can stay until uh, the two p.m. end of the conversation, uh, just so that they can give the report back. Uh, from their group. Um, so we will reconvene at 1.30 p.m. And uh, we just ask that when we do that, that one member from each group provides a summary of, of what was discussed and the solutions or ideas that people are proposing in each space. So I will be going ahead and sending out the invitations to everyone and we will get started. We'll see you back soon. And thank you again for joining us. This is gonna be a great conversation. I believe most everyone has made their way over to their room. So um, I just want to just uh, kind of note that I do have an unstable internet situation here. And so I'm going to rely on my co-captain here right. to guide this uh, plane. And why don't you first kind of set us off for the first part of the conversation? Sure. Um, so let's um, begin to talk a little bit about um, um, are we looking at the, the prompts and questions that we had, um, Counselor? Yes, we're looking at the document. Um, 
there's uh, some conversation around reopening. So yes. let's just kind of like do some high level. Uh, I we we'll, we only have let's just say forty. How many time? Okay, great. That's all I need to know what the time limit is. Okay. All right. So one of the the questions as we think about um, reopening, a, a majority of colleges in Boston are reopening to some extent, and how will that impact the city? So as we look at now um, holistically, how does reopening impact um, our city? So let's let's start with that and have a a, a quick conversation about that. And just so you guys know, what we tend to do is call you out if you don't raise yes. your hand. We put you on the spot, and um, and just because you're not being seen, you are still heard. And uh, Oscar, I'm going to go to you. See if you're paying attention to the conversation. Uh huh. Oscar, Oscar's still on. Oh, Oscar just left. How about um, Joe? All these fake people acting like they're listening in, and you know they're not. They're probably they're doing some other work. I see Vanessa. Vanessa's a good student. She's ready to go. There Vanessa, go. talk to us. I mean, to answer that question, you know, we know a, a huge part of our population is coming back, um, many from out of state. Um, and, you know, that's going to affect you know, the, the housing market, uh, you know, I think, you know, students always have the choice whether to live at university housing or, you know, in the community. And, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, they're able to get, uh, you know, t like a lot of them occupy what was once family housing, you know, you can, the rent is high, you can split it a bunch of different ways. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it's just going to cause an increased density in, in our neighborhoods, um, which, you know, makes social distancing really hard. I think, you know, we're seeing COVID rates go up and we know um, if you've ever been around any of the college neighborhoods, um, how crazy things get around move-in. Um, I know BU's move-in starts on um on the 14th of august so this is this is really happening uh uh the the campuses are opening and and uh you know i think that poses a risk for workers i mean i think like the the universities you know have have released these really robust testing plans mm -hmm. uh you know they're asking students to take uh they have to have three negative tests before they're allowed to go on campus at at Northeastern um uh you know I think you know they're they have these really ambitious plans about how they're going to be able to do rapid testing uh you know that rapid testing hasn't been made available to uh the surrounding neighborhoods um you know it's uh it's unclear how any of the any of the um, protocols that they're putting in are enforceable I think uh, college students are adults and they're, you know, able to do whatever they want. You know, they'll be riding the T. Um, you know, these campuses, they kind of think of themselves as like these like insular places, but really mo like most campuses are urban campuses and they're very much integrated into our communities. Um, and I think that, you know, uh, it, it, it's tough because I, you know, everyone wants to be optimistic and get back to work. Um, but if it's not safe, you know, what, what does the university owe? You know, these, these institutions have large endowments. Um, we even saw that like Northeastern uh, had, uh, had, um, did not even, they had a budget surplus um, at the end of the year from the cost saving measures of the, of the shutdown. Um, so I also think that we need to make sure that uh, Northeastern and all of these other colleges are contributing their fair share to the greater city as we're all going to be going through, um, everybody's going to be going through a recovery and we need to make sure that as we recover from this, that, there, that there's equity. 
thank 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 you for that um vanessa um one of the i mean you made some excellent points in terms of the importance of not just you know the the students who are returning i see someone put in here too as well that they are the students are already starting to move in and it seems like that based on what you're saying there's not enough um you know precautions or enough conversations that has happened around that process so in in regards so again you have to think of the health and safety the, the physical the physical um well-being of not just the students but the people who also may live in that community who may not be um students of that community um as well and how do we take that into consideration um one of the other things is that how how do we go about maximizing those opportunities that might be available i know that i see some other names on the screen um i don't know if you're here i see a greg i see a liz um, if any of you have any response to um, any of this in regards to the reopening of many of these colleges, whatever community or city that you um, you might be representing. Liz, are you? Hi, Liz Braden, Councillor for Alston Brighton. We've got uh, Harvard, BU and BC. Uh -huh. um, then we have students from other universities living in our neighbourhood as well, both in the city and outside. So. Uh, we are really concerned, especially folks living in the neighborhood. We are really concerned about off-campus students, especially um, because as someone said earlier, um, they don't, they're adults, they'll do what they want to do. And we don't have a whole lot of control over what happens, especially in relation to large gatherings and wearing of masks. Um, a lot of the off-campus housing, um, they live off campus because it's more affordable to live, than living on campus. But the housing, uh, very often they double up and it's more, um, they, they double up to save money. So there's a lot of students living in a smaller, in a, in a smaller space. So um, I must say we have lots of concerns and, um, uh, you know, this is a very infectious uh, virus. It's, it seems to spread, you know, fast. And uh, um, I'm, I'm a little concerned, uh, you know, for folks living on, students living on campus, there seems to be pretty rigorous protocols with regard to testing, but I'm wondering if students living off campus are going to have those same protocols. Uh, one concern I have is that if there's an outbreak in a, in a house, an off campus house, uh, will the universities uh, be um, offering quarantine facilities and medical supervision and treatment for those students who are living off campus? Um, you know, do they can they go to, into quarantine on campus and be taken care of, or will they have to uh, stay in the community in their housing in the community? Which being in quarantine, I don't think that's going to work. So those are my concerns, and the concerns I'm hearing from our our neighbours in the neighbourhood. All right. Um, so would, 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 and, and did this go, and is, uh, Soren, would you like to say something? I just saw your screen open up. Yeah, I do. Um, yes. so this is a brief introduction. So, um, my name is Soren Henry. Um, I am a staff member at the Newgar Library at Boston University. And, um, to speak to, uh, Liz's comment, um, Liz, thank you so much for bringing up the testing. So I have a lot of thoughts on reopening, but one of the things I am very worried about, um, is the testing and not just for students, but for everyone involved. Um, I think that there are some loopholes that are not being addressed, um, or not even being considered. So one such loophole that I, you know, I've brought up to several people at BU now um, has been the testing categories and the way that the different departments are handling um, bringing their employees back to work. So um, I think as Kara mentioned, when we were all broken out, um, everyone, as I understand it, I've spoken to several, several people now um, at Muger, um, is being asked to come back at some capacity so uh, President Brown sent out a memo in July that basically said, um, you know, it was a rough overview, but basically, you know, there was a flow chart in this memo, and you, I believe you can find it online. And it said that if you can do your work remotely, and if you don't, um, 
you're not required to basically have contact with the students, um, then according to your supervisor, you would be able to work remotely for the rest of the uh, for the rest of the semester. I can't speak to other departments, but as far as Muger is concerned, that has basically been thrown out the window. So um, basically, uh, K. Matthew Dames is the university uh, librarian for uh, various li libraries on campus, um, and the rest of the executive team. And I'm assuming some supervisors have decided that um, everyone, all of us are going to have to come to campus in some capacity, whether it's hybrid or uh, adjusted schedules and things like that. But we were placed into, into different testing categories based on, it seems to be our mode of transportation to work and not yeah. based on our ability to work remotely. And so to speak to Liz's point about categories, um, one of those categories has me really, really concerned. And that's the one that's right before uh, category four, which is the official, you can work remotely period, mm -hmm. which the library seems to kind of be pushing off on, on HR and letting HR make those decisions based on health and CDC age related categories. Um, if you're in category three, according to the university, you're only getting tested once a semester. Now, I don't know if this has been updated since July. The last time I checked, you are only getting tested once, once a semester. And my concern is this, if someone's husband, let's say, is goes grocery shopping, comes back, unfortunately, if, you know, infects their significant other, that person is a library employee and they come back and they have COVID asymptomatically, there's no way to know and there's no way to catch it. And, you know, we are being encouraged across campus to bring our own lunches and eat at our desks. So that's basically indoor dining. So now we have people who could be asymptomatic, who are not going to be caught if they have the disease and, you know, can, can spread it or they could catch it from a student in the bathroom. I mean, there's a lot of talk of the ability of the virus to be aerosolized. It's just, it's, there's a lot of concern there. And I don't think that even the testing categories as they have been created um, are robust enough to really catch all of the different uh, ways that the virus can spread, especially since it seems to be by department or by building as to how the categories are actually being uh, treated in terms of returning to work. So that was my little bit. Thank you for that. And, um, you know, as you were speaking, what I'm hearing is, you know, the inequity, right? Because it's basically speaking to these categories that they have put folks in and who's in those particular categories. So then it, it does, you know, in some ways leave out, not leave out, but put, put someone else at a, a lesser degree of being tested on a regular basis, just based on, you know, the scenario that you gave. So that's a sense of um, inequity that's, that's in that, 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 um, that thinking in terms of categorizing people from that perspective. And if I could just add one more thing, because I find it very interesting, we bring up equity. We were actually told that it is because of a shared equitability of burdens that people who wouldn't normally be asked to come back are being asked to come back. And I'm finding that to be kind of the reverse unfair. It's like, you know, those who unfortunately have positions that are required to be interactive with people, um, because those people exist now, other people who wouldn't have to be exposed and, 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 and have a risk are now being asked to have a risk, um, which I think actually makes it more unfair for everyone involved. But I don't want to take up other people's time. So that's all. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if there's any faculty in the space who can speak to, um, you know, your thoughts about, you know, how do you feel um, if you feel supported in this process um, um, and being protected by um, your employer in any way? If there's any faculty in this space, we can just get a, a sense from you in terms of how you are um, experiencing this for yourself. Ken, are you, or Paula, I think I see your mic just went off. My, is, my mic is on, isn't it? Yes, it is. Okay. I'm staff. 
I just got here, so I'm, I'm not sure what was covered so far. Okay, so I'll probably come back to you. Um, I just okay. want to get um, Paula's um, response. We are talking about um, the reopening process and really looking at what's happening within that process and, you know, sort of looking at the physical um, well-being and the mental health well-being. And so now I'm going to, um, you know, move on over to Paula and ask her, um, and which, which this includes you too as well, um, Ken, in regards to the faculty perspective in terms of feeling supported, feeling like, you know, some protective measures are being um, put in place by your employer. Um, the problem is, is that uh, I just finished teaching via Zoom, that's why I'm late, but I don't like being recorded. It's not because I'm afraid of BU, it's because in general, I'm extremely self-conscious. So this, so is this gonna be like on YouTube and everybody can go and watch my opinions? Cause you know, I'm happy to share, but I just don't like the idea of being recorded for everybody to see. I mean, I can give you a couple of opinions. Sure, I'm not resisting, but I'm just asking, is this just gonna be for everybody to view who wants to? Uh, yes, so this is- Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, so- um, uh, it's, you know, I'm at BU and it's extraordinarily complicated, as you know, and I appreciate the town hall meeting and in terms of being supported, that's a really huge open ended question. And uh, uh, I'm one of the many full time non tenure track A couple of years ago we joined SEIU local 509. So we're working a lot together to figure out how to support each other's uh, each other and how to move forward. Um, so it's not really about my being feel supported. It's about the, the uh, how many people feel. No, I'll speak for myself. Sorry. We feel as if uh, I feel sorry. I just worry about the safety period of the plan. And although the administration sends out email after email and we have nothing but groups and meetings and things as the semester is drawing closer as COVID is doing what it's doing. You know, personally, I'm, extre I'm extremely concerned about the safety for everybody. I mean, all the students coming in, all the people, every single person on campus, no matter what they do, how it spills out into the city of Boston and beyond. So I don't know if that helps, if that answers your question at all, um, or if that's just more blah, blah, blah. No, no y y yes, it does. Um, you okay, are speaking thanks. from, you know, the holistic perspective and you did say that, you know, for yourself personally, um, you know, how you're thinking about it. And I appreciate you being um, open and honest about, you know, wanting to be recorded and, you know, helping us to understand that. So thank you. No, thank you. Your thank you. Your perspective this, on is, that. this is an extraordinarily, you know, this is such an important situation and I care about it on all levels, you know, obviously for, we don't want anybody to have to be laid off at all, but at the same time, we don't want people to be working under threatening um, conditions, period. So what's the solution to that? And last thing is it's, a, it's something very near and dear to me because, you know, I grew up in the city of Boston. My, my, par my parents worked in the city of Boston. My father was an educator and, you know, so I care about it on every, on every level, that's all. Well, the hope is, at least from this, this conversation, that we can begin to think of some ways in which we can put maybe an action plan together with the hopes of everyone's voices being heard from the faculty, the staff, the students, the, the, the library workers, the dining hall workers, the folks who clean, and again, people who live in the city where all of these schools are representing. I happen to be a, a, a graduate of, of BU, and I know that along that strip of Commonwealth Ave, it's primarily students, because I was there. And it's, it's, it's loaded with a lot of students in and out. And then there are people who live in that community who are not students in that community. So that, that has an, a, a huge impact that spreads throughout um, the city as well. If I well, could just add, yeah. add a small thing to that. Um, I, I work right on Comap, so. And you are absolutely right, you know it. And I can tell you that a number of different times during the course of a day, you might see the sidewalk the de I'm, maybe they won't do it now because they're going to pay more attention to distancing. But before that, there were times when you could not actually walk through the sidewalk. It would be wall to wall students from the BU bridge all the way down beyond 
all the way almost to Kenmore Square sometimes when mass events are going on at once. I'm, I would, I'm quite sure they probably won't do that now, but, but it is, it can, uh, a college campus in general can be a very dense place. Well, however- And, and, and very intimate. I, I don't want to dominate at all. However, and I'm just telling you what's been reported again and again and again, uh, supposedly they're going to have, be having arrows on the sidewalks and just everything has been planned. So I'm just telling you, but I, that doesn't mean I, yeah. I believe it's safe at all. Yes. Yes. They've thought about every single detail they can, yet students are already starting to come back. Well, I don't, I don't know if others have said that before. Um, when I first saw all the things they were doing, I was very pleased and I was very proud. It looked like they were really taking everything into consideration, but as time has gone by, even their own statements and policies have not been followed up with, with respect to staff. And I know that factually. They are not making in some places, in many places, any attempt to allow staff to work from home when we successfully have been even though that's their stated policy. And uh, I'm very now very, very frustrated and very upset and very shocked at the way they've been handling the situation. Thank you. And the, 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 the last thing is that's why, okay, I teach in a, oh, hi, Mina. I teach in a department where, you know, we teach languages and we got after strong letters, et cetera, what's called a pedagogical exemption and so people who teach semesters one, two, three, and four do not have to teach with this new configuration because it's impossible to teach with masks. So we got this kind of exemption if we teach at these four levels where we do not um, have to be teaching remotely. However, we do have to agree to meet with students X number of times on campus. So we will not be in the classrooms. But then again, there are teacher people who teach above the four semesters, and so so it's it you know it, it depends on the department. It's it's just that's all. I can't represent the administration, so that's why I'm muting myself. Thank you. Thank so you. this is Julia. I, I've had some problems with my internet. I'm on my phone now. I'm not sure if you can hear or see me. We can see. Do okay, both. great. Yes. I I and I'm sorry, Gail, that I have left you on your own. But I know if anyone okay. could handle this, it's you. Um, I I do have a question, and I'm not sure whether or not we've talked about this. Um, but I I've, I've heard a lot from faculty. I'm just curious about some of the uh the other type of staff. Um, like I mentioned earlier, my mom was a is a food handler. Um, there's cafeteria workers, there's janitors, there are um, administrative assistants. I'm just curious about what um, voices and, and conversations are being had um, within the, this population and if anyone could speak to that. I, I can just tell you a very small, very small amount of information, which is that I know in the area that I work, the buildings and grounds worker, cafeteria, et cetera, have all been on campus from the day one, from the closing. They've been there throughout. And that's all I can tell you, but they have been there. And um, doing incredible work, making us all safe, cleaning everything up and down every day. But um, they're not, you know, they're not unionized and they don't really have much of a voice. Uh, buildings and grounds is unionized, but uh, cafeteria workers are not. Yeah. And, uh, or food workers, food service workers. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, they're just told to go home or sometimes that, for instance, you know, the GSU was, they, they remodeled that entirely this summer. So they probably lost their ability to work, I, I would guess during that time, because you know, there's no students and they can't be served. But, so that's all I can tell you from my perspective. No, thank, thank you for that. Um, my mom falls in one of those categories. She works at a, a college campus that is not unionized and so, her voice and um, her concerns are very limited in terms of who's listening. Um, I'm also curious about, I know that we have representation from BU Northeastern. I'm just curious as to whether or not, if, if anyone here on this panel is from UMass, and I know there are a lot of commuter schools, um, you know, there's some folks who are gonna be commuting from other parts of the city um, and across the Commonwealth uh, to attend our schools, the commuters, uh, just curious about um, what that transition uh, discussion has looked like and, and has anyone heard anything about what's happening with the commuters?
did my internet freeze again or that or was that a signal? Oh, no, you're that fine. Oh, you're, you're good. You're good. Okay. You're good. That's probably that's probably code that when it comes to commuters, um, that probably is not an issue or in top or a topic, um, because I think about the MBTA, I think about public transportation. I just think about that all of this, uh, all of these moving pieces, really impact our colleges and universities, and I think that that is also something for us to to look. Um, or at least to keep in the front mind. And um, Gail, just because I was uh, on and off, just where are we in terms of the discussion? Are we in the public safety um, space yet? Are we, where are we, are we talking about? Um, we were at the faculty and staff perspective in terms of what's, okay. you know, what's happening and what's going on. I'm not sure if there's any residents. I think we were sort of getting ready to move on to that perspective in terms of, those who live in the city, but may not necessarily are students um, or even faculty, but they do live in the city. And what is their perspective in terms of, again, you know, you've always experienced the influx of university students and college students, but this, this influx has a different meaning now. And just trying to get a sense from anyone who lives in the city, um, what, what that might be like for them. Well, one thing that happened when the when the campuses um, abruptly closed, you know, a lot of students were, you know, it needed to leave campus uh, right away and didn't necessarily have, you know, the means or the ability to, to travel back home. So what you ended up having was, you know, people saw in Mission Hill, Roxbury, South End, Jamaica Plain, that students were doubling up on housing. They were looking for places to stay in off campus housing. And so, you know, I think that's a that's a concerning thing if the campus were to abruptly close again. Um, like, and you know, like I said, a student may opt to to go move off campus. Um, you know, you can save a couple thousand dollars a couple thousand dollars in rent by moving um, off campus. And you know, the level of surveillance and monitoring that would exist in student housing that even gives students more of an incentive to, to move off campus. And then that ends up increasing, increasing the rents and pushing and pushing families out. Um, I know a conversation, and I don't know if I'm, I'm taking it to another level here, but I know a conversation that I, I haven't, or a perspective I really haven't heard as you were speaking, Vanessa, in regards to if that we open up and then have to um, close again in regards to the, the, the immigrant students or the students who are from other countries who come into the city for schooling and having to abruptly find, you know, someplace um, to live or, you know, that becomes a challenge too as well. And I don't know if anyone have any, any um, response or thoughts to that particular issues in terms of how is the, how are we, how are the, 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 the schools are thinking about that population of students in terms of the immigrant students who are in their space. Um, and after we answer that question, if anyone has a comment around that specific question, because we have 10 minutes left, I'd like to be able to bring back at least one or two uh, recommendations that we would like to share from our group just because we want this to be a solution based like we already know what the issues are I'd love to be able to come back into the space and offer some some very specific um, solutions uh, so if someone could address the the immigrant um, situation and then come back let's just do a little quick brainstorming of things that we can share that would be great Um, because I came in late, I just wanted to know whether um, any of you have expressed the official position of, of the city of Boston uh, about the enormous influx of students that will happen and I, I, what Boston's concerns have been, Boston, Boston government. Yeah, so Mike, uh, our council call. But I don't want to waste, if there's precious yeah. little time, yeah. you might have done that already. Yeah, um, Ken, you could watch the tape in the beginning. Um, okay. uh, Councilor Asabi George, uh, Councilor Bach, and myself have expressed our, our concerns okay. in our statement. All right. Uh, how would I do that? So, 
So this is currently being live streamed uh, on our Facebook page, uh, and it will be avail and it will be available there. Additionally, I'm recording this uh, Zoom call, so I am happy to provide a I'm happy to provide that file to uh, people who would like to uh, view it. I can include it in the debrief follow up that will come after this meeting. So if if you have okay. my email, you, you'll send links. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you can also just. Yeah, can you just, Brady, can you just, can you handle that transaction via chat just because we're running out of time right now? Okay. Um, if we and could just we need to um, get the solutions. Bring some, yeah, please. So, so one of the things as we are, um, have a few more minutes, you know, what, what are two solutions that we can um, sort of come up with so that we can um, really look towards what makes sense in, in, in understanding all that's going on, what we have heard, we know what the issues are, what are some solutions that, um, you know, folks are, are thinking that might be um, viable in this particular um, situation? Well, I think I think the universities should be um, promoting remote work, however, however possible, um, and that uh, that workers need to be given a seat at the table in in developing these plans, um, and that feel like they have a voice and that they have a that they have a choice without putting their their job security um, at risk. Uh, and then and the other thing too. You know, I think all of these universities have explained how they're going to ramp up their testing, their their testing capacity. I think I think all of those health services need to be offered to Boston residents as well, because mm. if they're able, if they really are able to deliver test results within six hours, uh, you know, I think I think that shouldn't be something that's only accessible um, to the to the staff. Mm -hmm. and, and and students, I think that needs to be accessible to all of us who will have to cross paths and be in the same environment um, as the university. So you're uh, you're basically saying, um, Vanessa, one second, can be um, yeah. not just you know the university students, but anyone within the Boston community, which includes, you know, Dorchester, Hyde Park, Jamaica Plain, should have access to um, testing. Okay. Just wanted some clarification. All right. uh, Ken? I'm fine, I'll let others speak. Is there anyone else who have an idea for solution as to how we can um, move forward with getting um, to, to talking about some more solutions that might be helpful and necessary in this this um, situation. I'm sorry because I joined so late, but um, so I I missed this. But is there any communication with the governor? Hmm. Um, Councilor Mejia, do you know? Well, that's a good question. It seems like you, you would think that uh, municipal and state government will be working more collaboratively on these um, conversations, but uh, that doesn't happen um, as much as it should, which is one of the reasons why everyone, um, I, I feel, feel somewhat disconnected. Um, I haven't heard much from the governor um, and convening this town hall, my hope is, is that um, what he gets from what he's hearing here in this space will help inform and influence and inspire his thinking. Um, but unfortunately, the, the short answer is no. Well, thank you, because you probably were there too. There was a six, six from 1 p.m. to after 6 p.m. meeting about this uh, several weeks ago. Um, people from BU and Northeastern were there. And, um, mm -hmm. There was already, there were several city councilors there and there was already the question about, you know, what's the communication with the mayor and then what's the communication with the governor. And so I was just wondering if there were any updates about that. And if I missed it, it's fine. I'll look at the recording. I don't believe we had that conversation in terms of updates regarding um, anything from the governor. If, if, if I'm mistaken about that, um, I don't know if uh, Julia, but um, Councilor Mejia would know, but 
I don't think we we had that conversation earlier in once when we started. Okay, thank you. Um, in the interest that like it's eleven, it's one eleven. One eleven. If um, if there is anything else that we can offer when we come back, um, if there would be great. Yes. Ken, I know you said you. you I'm putting you, now I'm calling you back into the conversation, Ken. Okay. Um, some knowledge, what, what would you? Well, um, I certainly wanna echo what Vanessa said before, um, that you know, even though I'm at a university and I'm unionized, I still feel like I have no say whatsoever. No, uh, fee <clears throat> not, they're not interested in what we have to say, or they basically won't even answer our questions and um, taking a very hard line with us. I guess the only other thing I would say is if you haven't haven't been doing it already, in your very all the busy things you have to do, is to keep your eye on the boss on the Boston colleges and just keep your eye on them and stay in touch because um, what they say publicly is often not the case. They're pretty good at PR. Can, so are you saying? Oh, go ahead. Um, Ken, would you recommend? No, yeah. I was going to say, it, um, and I'm not sure if this existed. I'm sorry if it doesn't. I didn't know about it. Would you say um, that there should be a coalition of, of external partners who are at the table to inform uh, government electeds on what we should be doing? Because I feel like there's always these task force that are put in place, but never there's never representation from people who are doing the work or living the realities. It's always handpicked by folks who, you know, who go along, get along, and apparently there there, yeah, someone is saying that there should be. And if there isn't, maybe this is a, a place for, for this group. I mean, we have over 100 people that have joined us for us to oh, identify right? and put to together that. some sort of coalition. Okay. Yeah, we had a really big turnout here, Ken. Okay. Um, Wonderful. People are on breakout sessions, they're going to be returning shortly. Um, so, my thinking is, is that perhaps. From this, a really solid next step would be to identify very diverse perspectives, not the, not the usual suspects, um, uh, to kind of convene and continue to push as a collective voice. And Vanessa, I know you as a community organizer and someone who has her ear on the ground, just curious as to this already exists somewhere. Is there a way for us to kind of help support it so that it could become more of a formal voice in, in, in different spaces? I know mostly for that. Northeastern. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes. We have the NU for the Common Good uh, <coughs> co Coalition um, that is welcome to anyone really who's, who's um, interested in paying attention to Northeastern. We have regular meetings um, and, and um, 509's uh, higher ed chapters are, are, are thinking about planning um, some different some different actions over the next few weeks. Um, so um, I think I think reaching out to the the unions on campus they have already been the most um, most uh, uh, in touch. So you know that's SEIU 509, 888, 32 BJ, um, MTA. Um, uh, we have those tables, but I think like we should have some more community folks. Um, involved um, in that process as well, where a coalition like NU for the Common Good has been um, really helpful to do that. Our next meeting is on Monday at 5.30, but I think we all also um, know that we need to band together with, um, with folks across the, camp uh, across the campuses. And I, and I think like grad students and undergrads are already starting to do that as well. Um, and, you know, I think, as these are private institutions, you know, we have to really um, uh, put pressure on them, but I, I really do know that they really care about what, um, what our city officials, um, the relationships that they have um, with the city um, moving forward. So I think, it, I think it's really great um, for um, our elected officials to uh, keep amplifying our voices. Yeah, so I think, Vanessa, if you don't mind, when we come back into the uh, bigger circle, I'd like to offer this as, a, as an opportunity and an invitation to others to join the coalition and to kind of expand that tent. 
um, because I do believe it's going to take all of us working in different ways to push the conversation forward. And oftentimes what I see in our city is that we usually work in silos. And I think that this is really a, an amazing opportunity for us to bring all of these voices under one tent with a set of common goals um, to push forward. So I think that that's definitely a really concrete um, suggestion that we can offer as well. Um, and I do believe, um, Brady, we should be coming back. I'm very limited because I'm on my phone, so I don't know. Um, and just to, to add to that, Councillor, I think someone was mentioning um, BC, Boston College, we tend to sometimes think about them uh, um, from a distance because they're in Newton, but they're still on that Commonwealth stretch, right? So <laughs> the fact that they're on that Commonwealth stretch, they're so close to the Boston community. So I guess someone was basically saying, which I think makes sense, that we need to include them too as well because it's so closely connected to the Boston community. Absolutely. That's a great point. Um, so Dr. Gale, I'm going to ask you to share two other um, solutions and I'll talk a little bit about the coalition building one. Is that fine? Then we end with that for our team. Yes, perfect. Yep. For report back. Okay. Cool. So I think everybody's going to be joining us. Ken, and you'll be happy to know that yes, over 100 people um, joined us uh, for this town hall. That's wonderful. I'm so glad. And thank you for doing it. And uh, I've never met you guys before. You're very impressive, too. <laughs> I wished I lived in Boston. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I believe uh, all the breakout rooms should be closed at this time. Uh, Brady, how many breakout rooms do we have? So we had nine breakout rooms and then our chat on the main call. So each of the breakout rooms uh, were numbered. So that's happy, 10. Yeah. So I'm happy to just go down the line and call on the rooms. Nor we can start with yeah. our group. Let you want to start with us, uh, Counselor? Let, you know what I'd like to do? I'd like to start with our group. Yeah. Okay. Yes, and let me tell you why, because we need to model behavior in terms of what a 30 second recap looks like, just because there's nine other groups and I want to make sure that we leave some time for some next steps. So we're going to do a 30 second little recap, um, which is just sharing. We already know what the problems are. We're going to go straight into the solutions. We don't want to hear a recap of what was discussed in that in our other chats in the interest of time. We'll just go straight to solutions if that's okay. Yes, great. And thank you for always keeping me on my 30. Am I still on? Yes. So thank you for keeping me at my 30 second limit. Okay. So there's two things that we um, talked about in our group was one, that universities should promote um, remote work. And not only as they're promoting um, remote work, they should try to bring everyone to the table, not just a small number, but everyone who has a collective voice, the staff, the students, the faculty, the dining hall folks, the, the, the library folks, those who clean, everyone should have a seat at the table and have an opportunity to be a part of the discussion. So that was one. The second one was um, looking at the testing capacity. So the school um, schools have talked about what their testing capacities are, but um, we are suggesting in um, that they offer the testing as well to the residents who live in those communities where there are students. So those are the two things we talked about, promoting remote work, bringing folks to the table, and also the testing capacities and not only offering it to the students who are attending these schools, but offering it to the residents who live in the communities where these schools are located. Thank you for that. And the last uh, recommendation that we uh, came to an agreement on is to explore an opportunity to bring those who are living the realities and doing the work to form a broader coalition. Because what we hear oftentimes is that we don't have all of the right people at the table to inform the dialogue. And I know that a lot of the work that um, Vanessa talked about earlier that she's doing with Northeastern, I think would be a great opportunity for us to bring uh, local elected officials, um, state representatives, um, residents, 
and community all, uh, all under one place to really move the conversation and the work forward as a collective. So um, you wanna talk a little bit really quick, Vanessa, about when your next meeting is and why it's important to open up the tent. Sure, for, for Northeastern, I mentioned it before, we have a coalition called NU for the Common Good. Um, and, it, and it's open to community members, students, um, workers, anyone who has a stake in, in what's happening at Northeastern. Uh, our next meeting is going to be on Monday at 5.30. Um, and I put my, I dropped my email um, in the link if you're interested in attending or joining that um, email list. Um, we're also on Facebook uh, as NU for the Common Good. Um, and um, yeah, we're, we're really interested in being able to, um, to work together and address all of our issues in solidarity. Um, so please reach out to me um, if you're interested. Um, and then I would also just encourage um, folks to be in touch with, um, with your unions um, as, uh, as we're all, all of our unions, SEIU 509, 888, 32 BJ, MTA, we're, we're trying to work together. Um, as we know, it, uh, like our members um, intersect all parts of campuses. Um, so if you, if you talk to um, your union, um, they'll be able to also plug you in to some upcoming action steps. Um, I know that, there, that there's, some, there's some organizing happening at BU and Emerson. Um, so yeah, reach out, reach out to, the, to the different unions. For that and in the interest of time we're gonna hold you to a 30 second recap um and i'm gonna have group uh one i guess you said brady we labeled the groups they were numbered one through nine wanna... yes yeah, so if we can have group one um high level just 30 seconds and we'll give you a little buzzer <laughs> to keep you on task if you could just quickly um give us your your top recommendations hey everyone um, my name is annie i actually work in the counselor's office um, and i had the opportunity to take um, the notes and share out what our group talked about my group was great they were really honest um, they actually one of our recommendations is to create a space for faculty to be able to discuss with each other um, in a place that's fear free from the fear of retaliation or losing your job, just trying to come together as faculty members. Other solutions, um, obviously giving us way more information. So information on, you know, what is the testing looking like in the community, protocols, what is PPE gonna look like? How do we um, enforce these policies in the classrooms with students? Uh, also, we want the universities to give agency to professors. That's really important. Uh, as regards to things around students, uh, I go to Emerson College and one of the things that we're doing um, is all students have to take a course about the new policies and protocols and sign um, community contracts. So that's definitely something that people in the chat were interested in. And finally, uh, I guess a question that our group had is would it be possible for the city to put pressure on schools to operate remotely? Clearly, as we saw from the call today, there's a lot of faculty behind it. And uh, someone in the call said that, you know, it's better to work as a united front with all of us. We have more power that way than we do as individuals. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. I'm gonna go next to group number two. Hi, I'm Christine. Um, group number two is awesome. And, you know, we uh, really agreed that the leadership of these schools have just very much failed. They have not done the right thing. And there's a lot of things to discuss and a lot of potential solutions, but there is an urgency right now. And we really think that the best way to do this is to try to figure out what leverage does the city council have and other public spaces to make the universities do the right thing now, like in the next two weeks, shut this down as much as possible and then long term do the work to make sure that everyone's at the table and that we don't continue to shift the burden of this um, epidemic, this pandemic on to the most vulnerable, which is what's been happening, um, you know, very consistently. Um, and 
few more seconds to just say like just that burden all over the place in terms of testing, in terms of who catches it, in terms of who has to take the tea, um, in terms of housing, in terms of who pays, in terms of childcare and who's expected to do this. And also in terms of who's expected to enforce these rules, um, how students are gonna have to pay for this and um, the burden of having to explain and defend policies that you had no part in uh, being a part of. Um, so just, but having a lot of urgency on trying to shut this down as soon as possible. Yeah, thank you for that. I'm gonna go to group number seven because the facilitator has to leave um, earlier. So I'm gonna just go out of order and just Brady remember, remind me that it, group three will be next. Um, so group seven. Thank you so much, Councilor Mejia. And I, thank you to all the, you and your co-conveners for this. Our group, um, we got very granular, but we wanted to come back up to a higher level to give two recommendations for next steps that we think are fairly concrete and that, that I think you in particular are well suited placed to be able to help with. The first is if um, amplifying the voices of all the folks on this call, but also who, all those we represent who aren't here by potentially doing what um, has been done at BU has been done by the unions, which is to send out a broad-based set of surveys to, um, he, to, and not asking, do you like what your university is doing, but more asking, what are your concerns? Give us examples and things like that. And so we wanted to ask you to help amplify those voices and to collect the information from the larger community. Second, since you are at large. <laughs> and then secondly, I think we were hoping that um, the, all the counselors on the call can do that, but also that all the counselors and folks who have political power and positions can start to use that. We only have one month before all these schools are set to open and students have already started arriving back. Um, to use your voices in city council um, to bring these messages directly back to the council, some of whom have very poor reaction. And that's our two recommendations. Um, I'm having technical difficulties. I, this is why we should not have, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, my phone is just totally acting up. I'm not sure what you can hear or see. Um, but but I, I do appreciate it helping me to work and I appreciate the recommendations. I'm going to move on to group number three. Group number three. Anyone representing group number three? Um, and then I, I'm just gonna say really quick, Michelle, I did, even though my internet was cutting in and out, I did hear your recommendations in terms of amplifying voice and how important it is for our elected officials now more than ever to really um, uplift this issue and really push these universities and colleges to do right by those who are living the reality. So I do appreciate that. And I know that someone was taking notes. Um, and so what I did miss, I'll make sure that I get. So I think we're asking for group three next. Some of us may not remember what group we were in. I have a uh, list of who was in each group so I can read it out for the, for the uh, people on the call. Group three had uh, Evelyn, Francisca, Gabe, Gavin, Greg, uh, Roman, and Dan. So, uh, yeah, that's, sorry, that's us. I thought we were group uh, six for some reason, so I, I apologize. Um, okay. uh, so really, bri uh, really briefly, um, you know, we, we commiserated quite a bit. Um, uh, we all agree that mental health issues were being ignored. Um, we, uh, most of us, but not all of us were um, from BU, um, but uh, noting that BU seems to be have taken over the scheduling of rooms um, and that uh, that's sort of making issues of cross filtration a little riskier. So that's something we all need to keep an eye on. Um, in terms of recommendations uh, that came out, there was a sense that uh, we should definitely figure out what BC is doing as well, that they should probably be a part of this conversation as well. Um, and that also Brookline's government uh, should be involved since uh, BU in particular is right up against uh, Brookline. And so whatever happens at BU is definitely gonna spill over into uh, Brookline uh, that we all need to work together. Uh, and then finally, before the, um, 
before the chat ended, uh, a recommendation was made to basically explore what legal options there are to, to basically stop the schools from um, proceeding. Um, otherwise, there was a lot of sort of sharing of uh, personal um, sort of personal circumstances and um, just sort of a general sense of a, a lack of trust um, from the, the administration. Um, for other people who are on the call, please let me know if I, I missed anything, but that's that was sort of the gist of what we talked about. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, just because people are unsure of their groups, I um, will call out who, uh, who hasn't spoken yet and you know that you were a group leader, make your voice heard. <laughs> uh, Julia, I have a, a list of everyone who was in each group, so we can also uh, use that as well, uh, if that would be more efficient for people on the call. Yeah, I put that on the chat, but no, I don't think anyone read it. So yes, if you could do that, that'd be great. No worries. Uh, so next, so group four had Ian Adelman, Ian Chandler, uh, Nuria, Jasmine, Jason, Joe, and Julia. Yes, um, so we talked about a lot of things. Um, I think one, we had uh, representatives from uh, BU, Northeastern, and many of the other colleges in the area. And a big thing for us was in the cases where the universities aren't doing enough, we are hitting a brick wall. They are not going to change their policies on their own. Big reason that we're here, big reason we're talking in other places is they need to be publicly shamed into doing proper uh, protection for their students, staff, faculty, and community, surrounding community. And they also need governmental intervention to stop them. For example, BU was not going to do in uh, travel as a travel ban at all, a travel quarantine at all, until the state stepped in and mandated it. And even now, they're trying to absolve themselves of responsibility of making sure that students do that quarantine. So big things that came up where us was we need to um, we need to shame them in uh, the public the public space. Um, we need to actually uh, really push that it's not too late to shut down. We still have colleges that are deciding to shut down for the safety of the community. Um, the government is going to have to make BU and Northeastern do that. They're not going to do it on their own or at least put a lot of pressure on them to do so. And then the very last line of defense of actionable items is for everything that they are doing, there should be requirements on how to do it safely. They are not doing the right things, even in the controlled environment of the classroom. They are not dedicating themselves to making sure that the classrooms are safe and properly ventilated. In most of the cases, they're just saying, we're going to put in a box fan and maybe you'll have a window. They're not providing PPE at any point. So if anyone gets careless, forgets a mask, anything like that, there will be no masks available to them and we will be subject to their infection. And most importantly, we need to make sure that the state and local governments are saying, what responsibility do the universities have to public health? Because right now, universities are dictating the terms which means they're absolving themselves of responsibility. But if the state or local governments come in and say, oh, you can only teach in person if your classrooms meet these public health requirements of ventilation, PPE, other things that you are providing, it, all of a sudden it gets a lot harder for them to make a public health crisis. So we're really, we're calling out on uh, anyone with any voice or any power to really start putting pressure on these universities to do specific things to keep the public health safe. Otherwise, they will not do it on their own because they don't want to. Thank you. Thank you for that. I um, Before we go to the next group, um, and I want Brady to line them up, um, is I, I really want to point out is that I think these moments are really helping us understand that the people really do have the power. I mean, if we don't exercise our rights to speak up and push, then we're gonna continue to move with business as usual. And I think that these times require all of us to step into our power, every single person that is in this um, chat and those who are listening in. Um, because ultimately, uh, to be honest with you, 
you guys are far more powerful than you are leading yourselves to believe. Um, and I think elected officials can just do so much. Um, I, I do believe that, you know, at the activist in me um, is encouraging you all to raise your voices loud and organize the troops and get people to take to the streets because um, you all need to be heard. I, I just listening to this conversation really breaks my heart to know that we, we are at this point and it's taking this conversation right yeah. now to continue to pull on these levers. Um, Brady, next, who, who has next? Uh, so group five's up next. Yep. Um, so we talked a lot about how BU and other schools tactics are pitting workers against each other and how we can counteract that. Um, something important that Lori and our group raised is when counselors and other people are looking for data on who campuses lay off, they should also be looking not just at how many staff are laid off directly, but how many were not hired back. So adjunct instructors, et cetera, um, as part of that number. Um, a question our group had is, can Boston, Somerville, Brookline, surrounding communities, elected officials band together to petition the state in some way? Because it seems that the state has more power than uh, the city officials at this level. Um, and the virus doesn't stop at campus boundaries and it's sure as hell not going to stop at city limits either. So that's all. That's a great quote. <laughs> Thank you. It is. It is. Just, yeah. one quick, just one quick addendum. Kara had a point about cities using their licensing uh, authority to leverage against universities with the shuttle buses, with housing, et cetera. Yes. That's right, that's right. I'm gonna go next to, um, you all be happy to know that I went to my eye exam today, so I should be getting some glasses soon. I believe- <laughs> It's group six, group six. Group Thank six. You. Thank you, group six. Has Caroline, Lily, Liz Nell, Maria. Great. Go on ahead. Any representative from that group? In talk, um, I wasn't going to sum it up necessarily because I, unless anyone else wants to hop in, um, I joined the chat a little bit late. Um, we mainly talked as well about what has been said about budgetary restraints, um, budgetary um, opaqueness, and not knowing a lot about what BU is planning to do, not just within the university, but also how a lot of the implications are going to affect the greater Boston area. One thing I wanted to bring up specifically was that I'm curious how long, not even BU now that we're talking about BC and other surrounding areas, but how long this could last, um, especially as we get into the fall, more students are taking public transit, more faculty and staff, and with schools also returning, people are going to be out more. And I, I don't see the longevity of a lot of the policies. And with all of the leases turning over in parts that are mainly occupied by students like Brighton, Alston, Brookline, all of those leases turning over on September 1st. We have students who, if we're taking into consideration more than just undergraduates, because I feel like a lot of the policies have been focused on the undergraduate population because they're the ones that um, prospective students see. They're the ones that make up the majority of the resources and the financial considerations. But when you look beyond that to grad students, part-time students, commuters, um, and actually look at those who are signing a lease and then essentially stuck whether or not they're doing remote um, classes, they're in Boston to stay. And those are the people who are going to be contributing to the economy. They won't be eating in dining halls. They'll be commuting, they'll be supporting local businesses and also potentially bringing any infections they have back to these local areas. I just wanted to know more about, I guess, what BU plans to do to support not only them, but also the communities that the majority of these people are living in. Because I'm, you know, a person that also um, lives here too. I live in Alston. I am a BU undergrad and now I work at BU Law School. So I think there's a lot of cross issues there. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. And I know we went to group seven, so I'm gonna say it's safe to go on to group eight. And- um, We have, uh, sorry, we haven't heard. Oh yeah, sorry, group eight. <laughs> Noble, it's your group. 
Great. Um, um, so we identified, thank you first off City Councilor Mejia and all others for organizing this. Uh, we identified a handful of actionable items uh, that I can also plug into the chat or just discuss here. Um, we'd like to see that uh, universities are required to submit plans to the Boston Public Health Commission and not only that, but make them publicly transparent. We would like to have uh, numbers and percentages from all universities reported uh, of caseload, including how many are tested uh, once a week, if not more often. As was experienced today, we would like to have universities ensure that virtual access is guaranteed for uh, people with disabilities who are interacting online. And not only that for virtual access, but recognize the uneven and unequal distribution of access, especially with uh, just the storm a few days ago with people still struggling to get their internet back and with the impending fall and winter. We also would like to acknowledge the challenges of enforcing surveillance and who serves, who oversees that to ensure that universities can acquire PPE and address other potential equipment shortages and possibly uh, what would love to see is that universities must develop a threshold plan for when they plan to close the universities. This has certainly not been done at Boston University and I don't get the sense this has been elsewhere. And if people are able to work remotely, then uh, we should be able to, we'd like to hear from both city councilors and perhaps the, the, the state government at large that people should be able to work remotely. Thank you. Thank you for that. You know, there, there are people here that um, don't have their government names on their, uh, but I see a lady housing is a very active uh, chat person in, in the space. And I, I'm not sure what your, what your name is, um, but can you just put your name on the chat and your email address? Because I definitely want to follow up with you. Um, that would be great. I want to move on to group number nine, please. And group Hi, I'm, nine. Hi, I'm Sean. I think I was elected. Um, uh, many of the many of the things uh, we talked about have been already spoken of. I can't say that we really had actionable items, um, but one major point uh, has been that uh, remote teaching should be the way to go. Um, that BU is going to do their thing um, until they get political pressure to do otherwise. Um, uh, uh, one note we had, we were a BU-centric group. There were several graduate students in our group. And uh, one point that was revealing to me is that BU graduate student workers were, ne were never informed of the workplace adjustment form that they had to be uh, sent it from uh, faculty members and then distributed themselves. Um, uh, should uh, the in-person move forward, uh, they had some very good demands, including keep the workplace adjustment form open rather than making it a one week, one time opportunity, um, provide PPE to workers and students, which most industries are doing and, be, and our university is not, uh, making sure health insurance covers COVID related illness and also uh, an interesting one, transportation assistance to try to keep people off of the MBTA, mm -hmm. such things as discounted blue bike memberships and, and the like. Um, wow. Uh, if I've missed anything, Rochelle, please uh, weigh in. Wow, those are pretty great I, ideas. And I think also the clarity of the workplace um, process, the workplace adjustment process. So not just that they couldn't get the forms, but that they also, um, you just can't, the COVID hotline, you can't, you can't deal with it. So sorry, Julia. Yes. No, don't be sorry. This is a space for voice, Michelle. Don't ever apologize for speaking up. I'm going to go now to group. I think that was it. That was it. Oh, we did it. Okay. Yes. We just got 15 minutes. Um, that was great. Uh, I think that for us, what we're hearing loud and clear is that we need our elected officials to lean in a lot more to help support the conversation. I know that uh, Councilor Bach has been at the forefront um, 
and, and leading the charge. Um, and I know that Councillor Breeden as well, as both councillors have a vested interest in, in this conversation. Um, and so for, for, for our office, you know, a lot of the work that we do is about convening and creating space to amplify voice and then, you know, really serving as a microphone for those who are living the reality and doing the work. So I think that this is just one step for us to, to be able to do that. And I know that my uh, colleague, uh, Councillor Flynn, has also joined us. Yes, I'm shouting you out, Flynn, I can see you. Hope you know that everybody can see you. Um, he always shows up and he's in the space too. And I wanna thank you for, for joining us and, and being here um, uh, as well. I, I think in, in terms, uh, and if you will, I'll give you 10 seconds because you were late to the party just to say hello. Go ahead, Councillor Flynn, 10 seconds. Thank you, uh, thank you, Councilor Mejia, and thank you for your incredible work. You've been an excellent colleague, an excellent counselor. But what I like most about you is you give everybody an opportunity to talk about issues that are important to them. You listen to them, and you care about their um, their opinions. So I uh, just want to say thank you for um, the incredible outreach you're doing to a lot of young for for young people, Councilor Mejia. Well, so I appreciate you shouting me out, but I just want to say one thing about Councillor Flynn, since he didn't say it himself, um, is one of the reasons why we're such great partners is that he has a vested interest in making sure that um, we're, we're looking at issues of language access and accessibility, and also has been a big champion for immigrant communities. And when we're talking about those who are living the realities and doing the work, a lot of our immigrant brothers and sisters are out here working in these institutions, serving and providing a, a great service to students and faculty. And I think that oftentimes those voices go unheard and um, Councilor Flynn has, uh, Flynn has been a great um, ally in that in this space and really lucky to have you here. Um, so in, in terms of a really solid next steps, I think um, what we're hearing here on our end is uh, we just don't want to convene people for the sake of having a conversation about the conversation because we're all tired of that. Are we not? Can we all just shake our heads? Are we not just sick and tired of having the same conversation and no one is listening? So I, I think um, Vanessa uh, invited everyone to really be part of a larger coalition. And I think that these times require us organizing and working across our different um, departments, our different silos, our lived experiences, and to really create a one voice as it relates to this particular issue. And there is still time to apply some pressure. And there is still time to um, get our colleges and universities to do right by all, right? And so I think uh, that these times are gonna require us really uh, not just stepping up and speaking up, but to working in collaboration. So what, uh, and I want to also give a quick shout out to Natalie Held, who is um, who's my communications person in my office. She's my communications director and also a BU student um, for bringing us together. I know her internet is down, so she's unable to join us, but in many ways she helped bring this together and I want to bring her into the space. Um, in terms of next steps, uh, what we, we will what we will be doing is one, sharing the link is on our Facebook page. For those who are unable to participate, you have colleagues, please share this link with them um, and encourage them to watch and engage. The other, the other piece is um, we'll share publicly Vanessa Snow's contact information on our social media platforms so that you can share the dates and times of the next meeting. So I think that that uh, turnout should be a lot, a lot greater. Um, that next coalition meeting that's happening on Monday. I think that that would be a really great place for some organizing to happen. I, I think that that's important. I think um, I love the suggestion of uh, putting a, a little bit of pressure on our governor um, because as folks know, the people in the city council, our powers are not, you know, we're not ready to flex those muscles yet. So we're going to need some help uh, in, in utilizing our power to help push on our state uh, reps and uh, senators and, and the governor. So that's definitely something that we heard here. Uh, Brady will be sharing the notes. I know that um, if, each, if each team lead can just share in the chat or email Brady at Brady.baca, 
drop your info on, in the chat, Brady, please. Share your notes with us so that we can um, make this conversation public, right? I think that this is important because not everybody had the privilege of being in this space. Um, information is, I feel, is cash and currency and everyone should have access to it. So we'll make sure that we disseminate the fine, you know, what was discussed in this space and some of the next steps that came about. Does that sound like a good, you know, in terms of next steps moving forward? Um, and I will just say publicly in this space is that uh, I've been really adamant about uh, the way we move in spaces. And if we're not listening to the people who are living the realities and doing the work, then we're not doing our dual diligence as elected officials, right? And I think that now more than ever is our opportunity to step into that and, and, and listen to, to those who are on this call and those who are on the streets living the realities. Um, and so you have a commitment from me, um, from my office to continue to amplify this issue and stand in solidarity. Um, and, and then I think, you know, you, we can't open up our campus doors. Um, we can't open up until we're ready and people need to take responsibility for what that's gonna look like. And, and if th those plans are not put in place in ways that we feel comfortable, then we shall just continue to remain oppositional for anything that's gonna put our lives at risk. Um, and I, I'm not sure if Councillor, because this the way this works, I'm just curious to know if uh, Councillor Bach or Councillor Breeden or Councillor Asabi George are still in the call and want to end, want to share any final remarks. And if not, I'd like to give Ms. Lacey an opportunity um, because in many ways you brought us together. Would love for you to um, give us, to bring us home. Okay. Hey. Um, well, I really appreciate everyone being here. It's been extremely heartening and a really demoralizing time to see how many people are here not giving up and ready to continue to fight together. Um, I want to thank you for that. And let's not let this be the end. Um, let's stand for all of our lives and for the lives of our students and of our community members. Because if we don't stand up against this, what will we stand against? Thank you. Thank you. And I'm going to go to Gail to, um, as my co-moderator to uh, say our final words. So I think a lot have been said already and I think it's just important that we come together as a, <clears throat> as a collective because if we try to do this in our silos, then it wouldn't be as, as usable and workable. So we need to come together as a collective. So I wanna encourage us all to do that, to really come together as a collective. It doesn't matter what university you're a part of, the issue remains the same. So have a collective voice rather than an individual voice. Thank you all. Have a beautiful day. I'm not one to hold anyone hostage for the sake of holding people hostage, but you got five extra minutes to do what you will before your next Zoom. Thank you again for joining us, and we look forward to the next steps and being engaged in the dialogue. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Brady, can you save the chat, please, so that way it... So I wanna make sure that we save the chat. You know how to do that? I think you could export it. Do you know how to do that? Yes, I do. Cause I was jumping in and out because of my internet but I just wanna make sure that we have everybody's voices in one place and that it'll be easy for us to disseminate what was discussed on camera and behind the scenes too. Thank you, Brady, thank you all. No problem. Hi Amina, I see you still here. Oh no, you left. Hey, Robert. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to uh, end the meeting now.